You get dyslexia, just like you get brown or blue eyes. You're born with it. Welcome. I am Dr. Sally Shaywitz, and it gives me such great pleasure to welcome you to this talk that I'm giving now. It's going to focus on overcoming dyslexia, which is the second edition of my book. So again, it's my pleasure to welcome you, introduce myself again. I am Dr. Sally Shaywitz, author, along with my son, noted psychiatrist, Dr. Jonathan Shaywitz, of the second edition of the very popular go-to book, Overcoming Dyslexia, which has sold over 400,000 copies. I am the Audrey G. Ratner Professor in Learning Development at the Yale University School of Medicine, and along with Dr. Bennett Shaywitz, the founder and co-director of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. Our website, dyslexia.yale.edu, is filled with so much helpful information and you're welcome to visit. Today, I will be answering very common, but yet important questions from a group of wonderful dyslexic students from Park Century School, a truly outstanding specialized school in Los Angeles. Here, in this fireside chat, virtually everything that I will be sharing with you is directly data, figures, information, from my book, Overcoming Dyslexia, Second Edition. And I will refer to it as OD2, Overcoming Dyslexia, Second Edition. And as I speak, I will try to share specific page numbers where this information is found. In the second edition, my aim has been to bridge the enormous chasm that exists between what we are learning in the laboratory and what is being applied in the classroom. As a working scientist and physician specializing in dyslexia and attention disorders, I have cared for dyslexic children for more than four decades. It is these boys and girls and their parents who serve as the inspiration for all my work. So another of my goals in writing this book is to bring to the reader a new level of scientific understanding of dyslexia. Once you understand dyslexia, its symptoms, and treatment will make sense to you. There'll be no mystery, and you will be in charge. You will be liberated to reason and to determine on the basis of this new knowledge what is best for your child or your student. It has been an enormous satisfaction to me that I've been able to help so many parents to understand in very clear and logical terms what dyslexia is, how to identify it, what causes it, and most critically, what can be done to help. Judith Fuller, caring and dynamic head of Premier West Coast School for Dyslexia, Park Century School asks, Parents want to know what they can do to help their child with dyslexia at home. What do you recommend? What a great question. And fortunately, there are straightforward and really helpful activities parents can do with their child at home. The key, and this is important, the key is practice, doing the activity over and over again, frequently, but not for long periods of time. What is especially appealing about this activity is its simplicity, and at the same time, a great way to help your dyslexic child improve the most important aspect of reading, getting to the meaning of what she or he is reading. Here I am referring to increasing your child's ability to read with fluency, 
That means reading accurately, rapidly, and with good understanding. Fluency is the bridge linking accuracy to comprehension, meaning. So in terms of teaching fluency, I talk about this in OD2, page 293. Very simple. Here are the key factors in how you do this. One, practice oral reading, reading out loud. Two, practice reading connected text, not just single words, and practice reading this connected text aloud over and over again. And three, provide ongoing feedback as the child reads. It's important to note if a child is a halting or tenuous reader, just encouraging him to read silently to himself will not, I emphasize, will not make him a better reader. Only by reading aloud with feedback and correction will you see gains. It's important to know as well that reading connected text increases vocabulary and background knowledge, both of which are critical for comprehension. And you think of, well, how do I do this? How do I implement that? It's much more helpful to read new materials. Reading new materials produces more improvement and benefit than reading familiar materials. Also, when you choose reading material, it's helpful to use books that are referred to as high interest, low readability, and I have them listed in the appendix of OD2. So the take home message, building reading comprehension, you need both, both decoding and experience with reading connected text. You ask, how can you encourage your dyslexic child to read connected text aloud? Here's a great program, paired reading, just what it sounds like. A parent can work with their child for about 15 minutes. You don't need to do it for an hour or two. And here's how it works. Three steps. The parent reads the section aloud. Next, the child and parent read the same section together. And then third, the child reads the same section by himself, but with the parent providing gentle and clear feedback. And as I say in OD2 on page 295, I recommend making this the number one at home reading priority. Number one, you are training your child's brain and helping build the accurate neural connections necessary for quick and accurate reading. Here are some ways to both improve fluency and Believe it or not, make this fun as well. you find it on page 294. What can you do? You can read poetry, think of it. Poems are short, they have rhyme, and are perfect for reading quickly and with expression. So what some parents do is they stage a poetry party. They select a poem, the child practices reading it aloud again and again, and then you have something you designate as party night. The lights are turned out. You use flashlights or lamps to dim the light. And the child will read the poem. And in the appendix in OD2, I have recommended books of poetry. You could also do something else. You can stage dramatic readings of a selection from a play or a script. And there are now lots of plays written for children. So what you do is you do dramatic readings, and it's found that this improves fluency. A program that I really like is Reader's Theater, where in a 10-week period, it has been shown that children who participated in this made an entire year's gain in improving their reading rates. The children can face an audience or sit in a circle and read from a script. Reader's Theater is successful from as early as second grade, continuing through high school. Oliver, a wonderful entering second grader at Park Century School, asks, 
Hi, my name is Oliver. I'm eight, and I wanted to know why I couldn't stay at my old school. Oliver asks a very important and complex question. While the science of dyslexia has moved forward, unfortunately, far too many school districts and schools remain painfully behind in identifying dyslexic students, especially those bright dyslexic students who are of color or who are disadvantaged. Let me explain. Even today, in 2020, there continues to exist major harmful misunderstanding of dyslexia, especially regarding children of color and those who are disadvantaged. These children are commonly neglected and harmed by their schools where their reading difficulties are incorrectly, incorrectly written off to environmental issues or lack of ability. This is a major error and incredibly harmful to these bright, deserving boys and girls whose difficulties can be addressed and remediated, but only, only if each is identified as dyslexic and receives effective evidence-based instruction. As shown in this figure, the achievement gap between typical readers and dyslexic readers is already, I want to emphasize that, already present at first, first grade, and persists. More about this as an OG2 on page 141. Seeing this early gap, Dr. Bennett Shaywitz and I developed an evidence-based efficient screener, which is completed by the child's teacher on a tablet. Results are immediately available and indicate whether the child is or is not at risk for dyslexia. The screener is distributed by Pearson Publishers, who named it the Shaywitz Dyslexia Screen. And if you want to read more about this in OD2, turn to pages 170 to 172. Going forward, it is critical that we continue to work hard to educate policymakers, educators, and parents on the true nature of dyslexia, which is a major goal of the second edition of Overcoming Dyslexia. Right now, it is essential that dyslexic students are identified and receive evidence-based instruction early, early, and their progress carefully monitored. I cannot emphasize enough, waiting is harmful and not acceptable. What is recommended for meeting the needs of dyslexic students? The answer is clear and needs to be urgently acted upon. A school whose core mission is to educate dyslexic students. A school where dyslexic students are a priority rather than just tolerated. Such a school as Park Century School, and how fortunate you and all your schoolmates are to be at Park Century School. Here, as I discuss in OD2, the school climate, which is of prime importance, is excellent. A school where everyone is on board, where there are small classes taught by knowledgeable, flexible, caring teachers the instruction here is intense and of sufficient duration, where importantly, there is consistency in instruction across all classes and constant communication between teachers. The child is not isolated or ignored, but part of a community where he is accepted, where he or she is accepted and welcomed, a community where she is not teased or bullied because of her reading difficulty, I firmly believe this type of school specialized for dyslexic boys and girls is optimal. In fact, in OD2, I devote several chapters to such schools, Park Century School on the West Coast, 
Windward School on the East Coast in New York, and Louisiana Key Academy, a very special, specialized public charter school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In OD2, you will find extended conversations I had with the heads of each of these very wonderful specialized schools. Judith Fuller at Park Century School, Jay Russell at Windward School, and Laura Cassidy, founder of LKA. I must share that I can speak deeply about these schools because I am actively involved at each. So many parents want to do the right thing for their child, but the question is, how do they go about it? What they, do they need to do? So here, in Overcoming Dyslexia, second edition, on page 339 and going forward, this is my advice. One, to ask as many people as you can about the school. Visit the school. You must do this before deciding on any school. First, the parents visit, then the child. And you ask yourself, what is the climate like? Do the children seem happy? Do the interactions between student and teacher reflect mutual respect and positivity? Is there a sense of orderliness? Are the teachers and administrators open and friendly? And do they welcome questions? So you want to find out, how does the school view itself? Look at its mission statement. Does the school have a policy regarding children with disabilities? What proportion of children at the school have dyslexia specifically? What has been the school's experience with such children? Ah, and this is really, really important. Does the school use the word dyslexia? If they don't, you don't want your dyslexic child there. And in addition, you want to learn about the students who attend the school. Is the student body diverse? What is the most common reason students come to the school? And you want to learn about the academic curriculum, the reading programs, um, and so forth. How is fluency encouraged? What is done to promote a child's vocabulary? And what is the expected progress and the actual progress in reading of students at different grades? And there's many more things. And you also want to learn what extracurricular activities are offered. Are there team sports? If so, which ones? Do the teams play in inter interscholastic leagues? And what, is the, uh, and what are the opportunities for exploration of other interests in schools? Art, photography, drama, etc. So this is what you must do, and you can do it, and learn as much as you can before making any final decisions about where your child, who you love and care so much about, will be going. In selecting a school for your dyslexic child, I want to share with you the advice of one dyslexic who is brilliant, who is a professor at Harvard, and is admired all over the world for his scientific work and activity. His name is George Church. And here I asked him, if you had a wish about dyslexia, and this is on page 344, what would that wish be? And what he answered is, if you just had a school that embraces dyslexia as a feature rather than a bug, it would be great. I know it's tough on parents when you have a long commute, but I think it's even tougher on the child when he is in a special class within a school. I think having separate schools is better because when you're in a class within a school, you're still with the other kids for lunch and phys ed and other things, and you feel different. Yeah, I guess you don't want to be in that special class. You want to do everything you can to get into the regular classes. And so I think he really shares some heartfelt information as a brilliant scientist, and even more so as a man who has experienced dyslexia and is speaking from not only his brain, but his heart. 
Willow, a Park Century School fifth grader, asks, What is the best technology to help kids with dyslexia? Another great question. Technology can be a great help to dyslexic students from the very beginning of school, from grade one, and then in very different forms for different purposes in middle school, going on to high school, college, and beyond. There is great advantage to begin using some technologies, for example, learning word processing, beginning in first grade, and for these children to work on and develop facility inputting and accessing digitized text. It is important that a child is taught to touch type as early as possible and to know that first grade works for many children. Several good programs are available that work for these young children. These programs can be found in OD2 in the chapter not surprisingly called The Role of Technology on pages 430 and 437. Text-to-speech is perhaps the most ubiquitous of the technologies offered to all students, especially dyslexic students. Here, I want to make a very important point. While there are many advantages for the dyslexic child in using text-to-speech technology, there are potential downsides as well. I always tell my patients and their families, text-to-speech software is often very helpful to older children and young adults in middle school, high school, college, and graduate school, but must be used cautiously and sparingly in younger children who must be encouraged to read as much as possible. As I have already said, the way children improve in their reading fluency is to read connected text as much as possible. Text-to-speech technology can limit the practice in reading that dyslexic children need so critically. Just how helpful it is for dyslexic students to be able to listen to digitized or recording text is exemplified by stories of dyslexic students who endured years of struggle before they began using text-to-speech technology. For example, as one relieved dyslexic college senior explained, and I quote, I could remember just about everything I heard, but read too slowly to keep up, and so much effort was put into trying to get the words out that I had little comprehension afterwards. Once I began using text-to-speech technology, everything changed. I started to feel much better about myself. I really was learning the material, and I no longer made excuses to avoid doing my work because it made me feel so bad. The audio changed my life. For the first time ever, I got straight A's. So I want to share with you that note-taking programs are another very useful technology for the dyslexic student to know about. Of these, OneNote is particularly useful. It is what's referred to as a digital binder that allows students to keep content, take notes, text, writing, audio, or even video and has inclusive tools built in. These include text-to-speech, immersive reader, speech-to-text, dictate, and more. OneNote backs up to the web, so notes should be accessible from any device, and it is free with Microsoft Office. It has very useful templates, such as simple lecture notes, detailed lecture notes, lecture notes and study questions, math science class notes, and history class notes. Still another very useful app for students with dyslexia is Quizlet, basically an electronic version of flashcards. 
Quizlet is very helpful for learning math, foreign languages, geography, and many other subjects. It is very easy to make your own set of flashcards for subjects you or your child might need, but a major advantage of Quizlet is that other users of it, primarily teachers, have made their flashcard sets available for anyone to use. As one very successful dyslexic college student told me, flashcards help so much, especially if you write them yourself, because it creates an image in your head. And when I'm on an exam, if I don't remember it, then sometimes I'm able to close my eyes and to picture the card, and that helps a lot. Finally, I want parents and their dyslexic students to know that no matter what the technology, there is a learning curve associated with it. I always recommend parents and dyslexic students give themselves plenty of time to practice with the technology over the summer. Come fall and school beginning, you and your child will be so happy she took the time over the summer to practice. Caitlin, a Park Century graduate and now an entering freshman at Columbia University, asks, Hi, Dr. Shaywitz. My name is Caitlin. I'm a dyslexic college freshman at a university that requires students to take two years of foreign language. I was wondering if you felt it would be helpful to me to obtain a language waiver. My unequivocal answer, absolutely yes. Now let me explain. First, it's important to understand dyslexia, what it is and what symptoms it produces and what you're looking at is a figure that shows that dyslexia, the origin of the difficulties, is getting to the sounds of spoken language. And by doing that, it in fact impacts how we speak, how we retrieve words, how we read, how we spell, and our ability to learn a foreign language. As shown in this figure, Learning a foreign language, along with difficulties in spoken language, often shown by difficulties in word retrieval, in linking letters to sounds, reading, and in spelling, are the core difficulties experienced by dyslexic individuals. Dyslexic individuals exhibit persistent, extreme difficulties in learning a foreign language. How do you best diagnose or determine accommodations for dyslexia? Here, I want to refer to what now Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor had to say about this important topic. Prior to her elevation to the Supreme Court, she was a U.S. District Court judge presiding over a trial involving a dyslexic attorney's suit charging the New York State Bar with discrimination for denying the plaintiff's request for accommodations. And here's what Judge Sotomayor said. She astutely made these remarks concerning the diagnosis of dyslexia, and I quote, by its very nature, diagnosing a learning disability requires clinical judgment, clinical judgment, not quantifiable merely by test scores, end of the quote. Dyslexia is neither diagnosed nor accurately represented by a single score on a test. It is identified best by consideration of a broader clinical picture conforming to the known characteristics of the disorder. This makes it imperative that educators and evaluators become more deeply knowledgeable about dyslexia. As Judge Sotomayor indicates, to diagnose dyslexia and to determine, for example, if a student requires a foreign language waiver, 
you have to look at the big picture. If the student is dyslexic, that's it. Approval of the request for a waiver does not at all require a whole additional set of tests, as I have had at times requests from schools. This is utter nonsense and indicative of a lack of understanding of dyslexia and its major impact on learning a foreign language. If you have dyslexia, it is a result of your having significant difficulty accessing the sounds of spoken language, of your primary language. It does not require much imagination of what happens to dyslexic students when they attempt to access the sound system of a new second language, a foreign language. I have seen the results of this over and over again, so much so that at Yale University, we have taken the necessary step to granting a partial waiver of the foreign language requirement to dyslexic students who make the request. At Yale, the process is rigorous, and once approved, the student, along with his or her dean, determines what is the best solution. The requirement is that the student take a course, for example, the history or culture of a country that does not speak English. The process has been remarkably successful for all concerned, the students, the faculty, and the school administration. This makes so much sense. Yes, you want to enable students to understand the culture, for example, of a non-English speaking country. For a student who is dyslexic, taking a foreign language does not provide entry to such understanding, but rather far too often deep disappointment, seemingly never-ending frustration, and loss of self-esteem. I have personally witnessed a seemingly endless number of hardworking, bright dyslexic students who give their full attention to trying to learn a foreign language, studying day and night, neglecting their other courses, and yet still going on to fail and having to repeat the course. In the last chapter of OD2, where I introduce the reader to dyslexic adults, who are at the top of a range of professions, law, medicine, science, economics, writers, who share their personal absolute nightmare of taking foreign language courses in college. For example, a famed physician recalls his experience with foreign language in college to quote, with, this was almost the end of me as I worked my butt off to obtain three D minuses and a D in remedial French, end quote. A renowned economist recalls the trauma of failing foreign language in college. A much admired writer shares that, quote, I needed five years to pass the three-year foreign language requirement. I passed Latin I with a D and flunked Latin II, and then I switched to Spanish, which I barely survived. A late eminent dyslexic surgeon shared, I applied to medical school because I didn't need any foreign language for medical school and knew I could handle the science, end quote. Hearing one after another of these brilliant dyslexic men and women recall what a struggle and indeed horror taking a foreign language was for each, one cannot help asking What's the point of forcing a dyslexic student to take a foreign language that he or she will only fail or severely struggle through? A thin, fractured, and ultimately unsuccessful experience trying to learn a country's language does not bring a student insight and understanding of that country, rather just the opposite an instant where the student shudders when mention of that language is raised. Clearly, it is highly doubtful that she or he will ever use this language in the future, 
It makes no sense, no sense to mandate this. It is both pointless and harmful. Here at Yale, we too want our students to learn about countries that don't speak English. And our students learn this by taking courses that allow them to become familiar with and understand the culture of that country. This is logical and effective. I, along with many others, am so proud of Yale for its wisdom and care for its students. Willa, a Park Century fifth grader, asks, How do I explain dyslexia to my friends? Thank you, Willa. A question I am asked often, and one that dyslexic students are asked very often. You can tell friends dyslexia means being smart and having a hard time learning to read. Explain that dyslexia is an unexpected difficulty in learning to read in a person who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. And this unexpected nature of dyslexia is exactly the definition of dyslexia that is represented in the newest federal law defining dyslexia passed in December 2018. Basically, it means you can be very smart and still struggle to read. Dyslexia is a paradox, one captured by the Sea of Strengths model of dyslexia, which conceptualizes dyslexia as having a small weakness in getting to the sounds of words affecting reading accurately, which is at the same time surrounded by a Sea of Strengths in big picture thinking and reasoning. This means in dyslexia, you could be a slow reader and a really fast thinker. Indeed, some of the most renowned people in the world are dyslexic, including Nobel laureates, Pulitzer Prize winners, and the like. And you could see that at the center is a problem, a weakness in decoding, but it's surrounded by a sea of strengths in higher cognitive thinking, concept formation, reasoning, critical thinking, vocabulary, problem solving, empathy, general knowledge, and comprehension. That's on page 56. Basically, dyslexia is caused by a difficulty pulling apart the sounds of words and then attaching letters to the sounds. That's how we read. In dyslexia, the sounds can be referred to as sticky sounds, which don't come apart easily, as they should. As a result, a dyslexic may only notice one or two sounds in a word that actually is comprised of three sounds. This can lead to problems sounding out words in confusing words that sound alike, for example, general and gentle, in reading aloud, in spelling, and pronouncing words, and in accessing the sound system of a new language, that is, in learning a foreign language. Often a person knows the answer to the question, but has trouble accessing the sounds so that the right word doesn't come out of her mouth. A dyslexic has a normal brain without structural abnormalities or defects. At the same time, the express route to reading is functioning inefficiently so that the individual has to take another route, a secondary, bumpier, and slower, less efficient one. As a result, she will get to her destination, but it takes longer. This is why the accommodation of extra time is so critical for a dyslexic who knows the answer but just takes longer to read the question. Dyslexia is lifelong, but reading, especially with identification and evidence-based instruction, improves a lot. Dyslexia is very common, affecting 
one out of five people all over the world. You get dyslexia just like you get brown or blue eyes. You're born with it. So here is the key takeaway message. And this is so important. You can be dyslexic and be very smart and have a wonderful future, which I will talk about next. Dash, a thoughtful sixth grader at Park Century School, asks, I'm Dash. As a dyslexic, what kind of future can I dream of? This is precisely the question I answer in Chapter 34 of OD2, pages 489 to 523. You will be both amazed and heartened by these stories. Here, let me share with you some outcomes of dyslexia in real people who are wonderful, real-life examples of what the future had in store for some of our Sea of Strengths models. Here are the examples that are found on this chapter in OD2. You want to be a lawyer, but you read very slowly, and law involves a lot of reading. Are you being realistic? Can a dyslexic become a lawyer? a really good lawyer. So the sea of strengths in real life. Let's begin with David Boyes, renowned attorney, good friend, and dyslexic. Here's what he has to say. Most annoying is when people equate dyslexia with a thinking disability. Dyslexia gives you the ability to see the entire picture and step back from it and think. Because reading is hard for dyslexic, it forces you to rely more on thinking. And as you get out into the world, it is thinking that is a lot more prized than reading. You read so slowly that you wonder if business or finance is for you. Can dyslexics think of a career in finance? Listen to one dyslexic's experience growing up. And I quote, it's in the book, as a child, schoolwork never came easily for me. Reading and writing were particularly difficult. I was pretty good at math. Though I didn't know why at the time, I had to work three times as hard as other kids to accomplish the same thing. I flunked English at Stanford, not once, but twice. I couldn't write a composition. I couldn't finish a book. I never read a novel. I struggled in French. And you'll find this in OD2 on page 498. That was yesterday. So who is this dyslexic today? The sea of strengths in real life today is Charles R. Schwab, groundbreaking financier and dyslexic. I always had great strengths in thinking. Even though I couldn't read quickly, I could imagine things much faster than people who were stuck thinking sequentially. That helped in solving complex business problems. I could visualize how things would look at the ends of the tunnel. I intuitively got there much more quickly. Can struggling readers become exceptional physicians? Extraordinary cardiac surgeons? Here's a prime example of our sea of strengths in real life. Dr. Delos Toby Cosgrove, CEO and president of the Cleveland Clinic from 2004 to 2018 and good friend. Cosgrove sees failure as the starting point for a process of learning and discovery, he states that he's failed so many times that he has lost his fear of it. Cosgrove credits his dyslexia with, quote, teaching me to work like crazy, end quote. 
And so even after being rejected by 12 of 13 medical schools and being told he was the worst resident in his class at Massachusetts General Hospital and strongly advised not to go into cardiothoracic surgery, he did not give up, nor did he lose sight of his dream. His extraordinary accomplishments, both as a groundbreaking cardiothoracic surgeon, as an unparalleled leader and patient advocate in the Cleveland Clinic, speak to the wisdom of continuing forward and realizing his dream. Dr. Cosgrove's story is a powerful reminder that perhaps we need to rethink how we judge people and determine who has the potential to be a future leader and make a major contribution to society. And you could read about this in OD2 on page 512. I want to share with you on page 306 struggling dyslexics who have made it. For example, Nobel Prize winning molecular biologist Carol Greider, as I just mentioned, brilliant cardiac surgeon Dr. Toby Cosgrove, groundbreaking geneticist George Church, actor Orlando Bloom, children's book authors Patricia Polacco, she wrote Thank You Mr. Falker, who is very popular with children, and Dav Pilkey, who writes another favorite children's series, Captain Underpants. Entrepreneur and founder of Virgin Airlines, Sir Richard Branson. Economist and financial expert, Diane Swank. Entertainment super agent, Ari Emanuel. And Academy Award winning producer, Brian Grazer, who received an Academy Award for A Beautiful Mind. After reading these stories, no one should ever doubt a person like that, which is the title of this chapter, can be a winner in any field in which he or she has an interest and talent. So here you see an iceberg, and at the top, are all these very distinguished dyslexics who I've talked about. But I want you to remember, like an iceberg that's 90% underwater, there are pictures, images that you're seeing of all these children asking to be identified and helped. Let's not forget about them. They're very important, and we can help them but we have to identify them, screen the dyslexia, and give them evidence-based instruction and support. This has been a wonderful experience for me, the author and passionate advocate for dyslexics. And I think and hope for you, my audience, who care so much about dyslexia and want to learn as much as they can about it to help their child or students. We know that dyslexics who read slowly think fast and are capable, as you will read in Overcoming Dyslexia, of wonderful, rewarding futures. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.